Cook Melliron, as I always start all my presentations. For the latest from us farm advisors, there's several ways. Uh, you know, you can always just just call us up directly um, or email some advisors. Don't don't email me. Um, I'm bad at email, but newsletters is a is a traditional way that uh, we reach out to you. So you can sign up for in the Sac Valley uh, newsletters for walnuts, prunes, and almonds. And there's some subscription links there if you are up my way. And then uh, Dr. Phoebe Gordon, farm advisor in Madera and Merced and myself have a podcast along with Clarissa Reyes and the support of all of our UC colleagues called Growing the Valley, which you should all be listening to. Um, it comes out every week um, and lots of practical, uh, great information coming out on that. And you can listen wherever you listen to podcasts. And then there are also these regional websites. So there's SacValleyOrchards.com for the North. And uh, Phoebe Gordon has SJV, T, and V um, for, the, for the San Joaquin Valley. Um, so um, I am going to sneak in a second talk uh, <laughs> just because it's so darn timely um, with the freezing conditions uh, this morning uh, and the next two mornings. Uh, so this is, you know, fairly unusual what we're dealing with right now. Um, but we have been dealing with sudden autumn freezes uh, the, the previous three years, 2018, 19, and 20, um, with 2018 and 2020 being by far the you know, the, the worst. And so um, I had these five steps um, to prepare that uh, an article that, that Janine Hazy uh, and I wrote, and I've added a sixth here. Um, so it starts with the August fertilizer cutoff. Um, both my esteemed colleagues, uh, Mo Nuri, as well as Carrie Arnold, got into this a little bit yesterday, but um, it's so timely. Um, I want to go over it one more time. And then in September, uh, on young trees doing a, you know, withholding irrigation uh, until the terminal bud sets. And then if rains haven't come, go ahead and irrigate going into November. And then, you know, you can see it previously said, then, you know, we keep track of things, soil moisture and weather, you know, at least through like December. But uh, I think the, the weather this week um, following two dry months just shows us that uh, you may freeze season to, um, to walnuts is a little bit like what, uh, you know, fire season is, is becoming to California. It's something we kind of always have to, to think about at least for really solidly half the year. So November through April, uh, be monitoring soil moisture, um, and looking and looking at the weather. So if a freeze is predicted and the soil is dry, uh, which is the condition for a lot of folks right now, it should be ideally wetted two to three days prior. Um, as Dr. Kerry Arnold mentioned yesterday, a lot of folks don't have the capacity to irrigate right now because they're on surface water. Um, and if you do have that cap capability, however, um, some folks, uh, particularly up in my area, do use active frost protection, um, just like folks in, in Ammons do up here. So here's that terminal bud um, being set. Um, uh, photos from Janine Hazy. And then on November 4th, uh, we had a, a webinar panel um, with great information. You can find that if you just do a simple search on YouTube. And then, of course, Janine and myself have written zillions of articles on freeze over the years. Uh, you can find those at sacvalleyorchards.com. And then on the podcast, uh, fairly recently, you can just find it by searching Walnut Freeze with Janine Hazy. Um, Janine and I uh, discussed those, those best practices surrounding freeze. So now getting to the real topic at hand here, which is walnut whole orchard recycling. Clarissa Reyes pictured here really did um, all the, you know, she really just carried, carried the, the team um, on it these past nine months. She's a staff research associate funded by uh, the Walnut, Amund, uh, pistachio and prune boards. And she did an amazing amount of work on this uh, to, to bring these slides together, to collect the data, to crunch the stats. So tremendous thanks to her. 
Um, and then we also have uh, many other folks um, who, who really help us out. So um, David Dahl, former farm advisor, uh, gave me good advice years ago, which is start at the end. So it means you can now just zone out for the rest of the talk because the, the takeaways are this. Um, whole orchard recycling has been a proven success in Ammons. Uh, so far, there's no detriment to walnut growth in, in the two young orchards I'm monitoring. Um, and then really for all of California, uh, you have the potential benefit um, in, in making whole orchard recycling possible if you apply for those CDFA uh, healthy soils programs incentives. Uh, in the San Joaquin Valley, there's, uh, you know, the added carrot of air quality district incentives, but there, the, there is the massive stick on the other hand of a coming burn ban. So the process starts, and these are slides from, from Brent Holtz, Dr. Woodchip himself, a farm advisor in San Joaquin County, who is the, the godfather of whole orchard recycling. Um, so you, he started years ago with this question of whether you can just take the orchard at the end of its life uh, and, and chip it up um, and find, uh, have the, this, this wood benefit you in the next generation instead of it going to a cogen or, or just burning uh, in the field. And so can we turn that, you know, organic matter back into the soil without, um, without negative effects and potentially with some benefits? And so typically uh, it starts with, um, you know, your, your, uh, the, the default is really to grind up uh, what you've been spending thousands of dollars on um, and, you know, thousands of pounds of nutrients and, and, and everything uh, and all the photosynthesis and carbon, grinding that up. Uh, 25 to 30 years of photosynthesis and, and hauling it away. So can we actually capture that um, and have it benefit the next planting? So estimated at 60 tons per acre in Ammons, um, but it's expensive, which is why those uh, programs that I mentioned at the top um, are so important. Uh, these are the financial estimates and the different steps with um, uh, pulling trees, grinding, and then spreading the chips, um, and, and then finally incorporating here with discs. Uh, the discs, the discs shown here, by the way, are way too small for walnut chips. Um, not necessarily because the size of the chips, but the volume of the chips, which we'll be getting to. So after spreading the wood chips, growers can proceed with typical land prep practices, um, and you know, those, those chips really do disappear pretty fast. So in Ammons, folks like Brent, um, as well as uh, May Columber, who's one of our, our speakers today, um, uh, Emily Gaudi and a number of other folks, um, but tremendous leadership from Brent and May on, on this topic. They've shown increased soil organic matter and carbon, increased soil nutrients and microbial diversity. They haven't found more problems with disease. Um, didn't seem to interfere with fumigation. It improved water use efficiency because you have better water holding capacity uh, in, those, in those surface soils um, and then increased orchard productivity, even, even some, some higher yield slightly. Um, and then they have found, however, that it, they thought at first it required more uh, nitrogen fertilization in the first leaf, but their, uh, their latest research is showing instead it's earlier nitrogen um, with potentially even um, putting some nitrogen in the hole at planting uh, in some of their almond work, but getting it on much, much earlier, um, but not necessarily more nitrogen in that first leaf. And then same nitrogen, same nutrients, second leaf onwards. So a couple podcasts up um, on this topic and I'm going to be sitting down with Brent and May next week for an update. So look to Growing the Valley for that. Um, and they also have a website, orchardrecycling.ucdavis.edu, um, where there's a lot of great information. Um, and I hope to work with them to add more walnut information and more Sacramento Valley information. Because right now it's very Ammon centric and San Joaquin Valley centric. So for whole orchard recycling in walnut, um, 
so far there's two sites um, that are that are looking at this and a number of other growers are trying it on their own, but these are the two sites I'm monitoring. The first site um, is what I'll call War One. Um, it's also uh, called infamously Chipocalypse because um, it didn't. It, we were unable to accurately track the the chips deposited per acre, um, and then some of the chips went into the the no chip area. So it really became um, a, a demonstration, a pilot study. And currently. Clarissa and I are only tracking growth and monitoring tree health. Are there any increased disease issues? Um, what are the trees looking like? Are they, are they growing at the same rate as the control trees? So incorporated in, in 2018, uh, with the fresh orchard planted in 2019. And then you have uh, really no significant differences in nematodes or growth across the treatments. Uh, here are the uh, root lesion nematode showing some slightly elevated counts uh, in 2017, but then there was fumigation and it did not appear that the chips at all interfered with fumigation. And those levels uh, in the three years I subsequently monitored uh, were low and, and they were the same. And then growth uh, so far, uh, the chip trees or the control trees um, are all the same size. Uh, so uh, that has been good. Um, and then I did take uh, in 2020 some leaf analyses, and those actually showed higher levels of potassium and boron. And unlike the work in Ammons, uh, there was really no tailored nitrogen fertilization changes. This is, um, this is a great cooperator, Deseret Farms of California, and they, they farmed this first leaf walnut planting just like um, just like they would any other field. So here we are pre-plant, um, but obviously after you can see the, you can see the chips um, after planting uh, in that first leaf as they, as they grow, grow, grow in 2019. Um, in 2020, getting bigger in 2021 here, these trees look phenomenal and you cannot tell any difference um, between the chipped areas uh, and the, the areas we tried to keep the chips out of. Um, that's most recently. Um, but seeing that uh, that was, you know, that became a, a chipocalypse and didn't scientifically have the rigor uh, to really get into more questions beyond uh, do walnuts do okay in the presence of chips? Um, Cliff Bumel, uh, now the president of Agrimiora Nursery, um, reached out to me and, and tried to make this, um, this happen for a new site. So working with Matt Conant um, in Sutter County. So currently this, this new site's in its first dormant. Uh, we've found that the, the chips per acre is potentially much greater than what has been documented for Ammons. Um, and it's a properly replicated, beautiful plot uh, thanks to some incredible diligence uh, and careful work from Cliff. So here Cliff is on the tractor um, laying out chips. And um, so removed the previous uh, really old trees in 2020, planted uh, March of, of this past year, no fumigation at this, uh, this small site. Um, it's just a four acre site. So they didn't uh, weren't able to bring in fumigation or anything like that. But this is a site with lesion nematode, crown gall, oak root fungus, you know, the whole nine yards of what we see in so many um, old walnut orchards. It has a history of it. So um, it'll be interesting to, uh, to document whether there's any increased disease or issues. So here you can see I laid out these tins, uh, like baking sheets um, ahead of the chips being spread and um, just a, a literally a ton of chips here. Um, uh, and then that calculated out to 136 tons per acre wet. And then the, the number we typically talk about is the dry number. So 91 tons per acre dry. And that's well above the 60 to 70 tons per acre that has been documented in Ammon so far. And uh, needed some big, uh, you know, rice discs to incorporate this. Um, but it with those big discs, it incorporated beautifully. And here we are this past summer, uh, nematodes, nutrients, soil, um, growth, 
tissues, um, uh, and then yield uh, and other measures will be measured down the road here. One of the big differences right away, um, and you can, you can see in this previous uh, picture that the, the trees are really, really growing beautifully. Um, one of the major differences, and you can see it both in this picture and also in this picture is um, the weed suppression in this first leaf. Um, not only were the, the trees growing well, um, Cliff really got nitrogen to all the trees uh, pretty early on and in a bit higher rate than you would, than you would use in, in walnut typically. And he's on the call. Um, he's on the call today if, if you have more questions. But you can see the weed suppression uh, in those areas that receive chips. And then in terms of the leaf analysis, uh, we saw slightly lower levels of zinc and manganese and higher levels of calcium and copper uh, this past summer. But really nothing, nothing too dramatic. These are, rel these are pretty subtle differences. Um, and most importantly, the nitrogen level was the same. Um, and that's what we, you know, when you're adding a bunch of carbon, you do not want to tie up, um, you do not want to tie up nitrogen. Root lesion nematode is probably the most interesting thing going on. Uh, we just got these, these numbers yesterday from Amanda Hodson. So um, Clarissa just crunched this and it's astounding. So before trees were planted um, uh, in, in uh, I think it was before trees were planted. Anyway, the baseline measure, there was no difference. Um, uh, I just may have the wrong date here. Uh, there were uh, no differences and, and levels were pretty low for root lesion nematode. Um, but most recently here this past November, really high numbers for the control and those same very low numbers for the chips. So just one sampling, um, we'll see where this goes going forward, but really, really interesting. So, and then uh, no growth differences, um, both, uh, you know, at the time of right after planting there in March and then um, a year later. So again, um, proven success in almonds, so far no detriment to walnuts, um, maybe unknown problems, uh, you know, that we're, we're still to discover as this is early going. Um, and then of course we have the carrots and sticks out there uh, with the different programs and regulations. And no, I know a number of folks in the SAC Valley reach out to me and say, uh, you, you know, where's the information on, um, you know, who to go to for, uh, for doing this type of work. Um, so you can, uh, you can certainly reach out to reach out to me um, with those kind of questions. And I'm hoping to get more information um, out to out to everyone uh, with that information on what are the operators, um, folks like SNS um, and um, Randy McLaughlin. Uh, with Old Durham Wood are the folks I'm familiar with, but if you know more folks doing this type of custom work, um, please reach out to me and we'll get their details on orchardrecycling.ucdavis. And um, yeah, we'll have, we'll have more information out to growers this year. All right, I'm a little over time, unfortunately, um, but I could do a, a quick question or two. Thanks. Thank you very much, Luke, for... Uh... Great presentation. We don't have any questions in right now and we're a little over time. Mm -hmm. Oh, we can squeeze in one. Here's, here's a few that are coming in. Let's just see if we can squeeze them in. How much nitrogen is needed for the first year? I presume this means after incorporation. Ooh, I should have these numbers in front of me and I don't. So I may look them up and put them in the chat. Um, Cliff, are you able to note on a little bit about the program you used in this, this new planting? Yes. Um, can you guys hear me? Am I coming through? Yes. Yep. Okay. Um, you know, I just looked at this the other day, the recommendation on the, uh, the, the website that has all the, the, it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's a UC website and what's the, it's something like, you know, um, 0 0.3, 0 0.2 to 0.3 pounds per tree of in, in the first year. And then if you feel you need potassium or, Phosphorus, same thing. If you're in really poor soils like these sands are, that just duplicate that. So based on <clears throat> what Brent had said and what sort of the community of whole orchard recycling people said is, 
you know, you may want to kind of consider doubling the in rate the first year just to kind of get past and through the the um, the, uh, the problem of tying up in the uh, organic material. And as I'm a nurseryman, it grows potted material that's 100% organic material. And yes, it's composted, but we know quite a bit about not having, uh, not getting in tied up in organic material since we grow in 100% organic material. So uh, long story short, what we did is as this was uh, not micro jets or drip and wanted to get in, this was good old hand style fertilizing and really targeted about a half a pound of in, which would be about a doubling rate of um, what the, the, the recommendation is, you know, sort of uh, the standard recommendation. And we used calcium nitrate for the, well, we did put down, re-ring the trees with a, an MKP just to get uh, plenty of potassium and phosphorus there the first year, very cheap, easy. And then it was every two weeks, uh, a half a cup of calcium nitrate um, around the tree spread in the root zone and watered in. So, and the way that calculated out at a 15.5% in on calcium nitrate, plus we wanted to get the calcium there. Um, exactly, exactly. We did every two weeks and then pulled back at the end, obviously, and tried to hit that half a pound. Probably could have done less because we started so early um, looking at everything now, but that's what we did. So in the calcium nitrate, the idea being its problem is how fast nitrate leaches. Well, we wanted to get it past the upper eight to 10 inches where all the chips were and get it to the root. So that's seemed to work really, really well for this, uh, for this particular situation.